गुड आफ्टरनून टीचर सो टूडे इज इलेवेंथ ऑनलाइन इन्फॉर्मेटिव सेशन ऑन इंडिया टॉक पॉवर पोटेंशियल प्रॉस्पेक्ट्स एंड रिट्रोस्पेक्ट्स बाय डॉक्टर विनय सहस्त्र मेंबर ऑफ पार्लियामेंट राज्यसभा दिस इज अवर इलेवेंथ सेशन अंडर श्री दत्तोपंत फेंगड़ी लेक्चर सीरीज एंड टूडे इज ऑल्सो महाराष्ट्र डे टूडे This day is known as Maharashtra Day. This is the day of formation of the state of Maharashtra, united with Mumbai, on 1st May 1960. So happy Maharashtra Day to all dear teachers, Rakat Desha, Kanpur Desha, Bhagwanja Desha, Nazuk Desha, Komal Desha, Puran Chahi Desha, Ham Ghava Mada Sriha Maharashtra Desha. Sarvanna Maharashtra Day ko kamga dena cha hardik subhicha. Now I request Dr. Shekhar Chandrate, please introduce our today's speaker. Yes, Mr. Friends, I am very happy to introduce my very long-time friend. We have been associated almost forty-five years now, and uh, I am pleased to introduce a very multifaceted personality, Dr. Vinay Sahasra Budde. MA with uh, literature in English there after a uh, phd in political science with this my friend has been associated with the social work almost all these years right from his student age and very dear to us is the thing let me share with you that dr vinay was uh, representing graduates in the university senate of our mumbai university Twice he was a management council member. Also, we know very well Dr. Vina is a very popular name and fa face on various TV channels in various districts. He is a very scholarly personality, specializing himself in a democratic process in the world and in particular of our country. He has written number of books. on this also but a very near and dear each to our topic to his heart i know is a northeastern area of our country northeast area he has traveled extensively there also and he has written a very good book on that also and friends right from his student age when he was devoted he has devoted himself as a social worker in a largest student organization akhil bharatiya vidyarthi parishad in that capacity he was a very important member and the leader of a, a trust which used to exchange students from northeastern states and other part of the country it is known as uh, acil interstate exchange program it was thereafter mr dr vinay sahasra with the joint a very well known institute known as rambau malgi prabodini and it is only his vision which could expand and develop this research and training institution uh, to a very great extent at present it is a very well known institution for teachers for uh, ngos for political activists and so on i know very well the very rich library they have developed in this institute also a academician dr vinay sir is there a very well heard as an mp in rajya sabha is uh, heard by all the parliamentary members very attentively friends uh, he has as a mp he has developed a, a small village he has taken up He has adopted and is putting all his efforts to develop that village area as per the motivation by our prime minister. Accordingly, is doing this. At present, Dr. Vinay Sahasrabhute is a chairman of ICCR, that is Indian Council for Cultural Relations. And in this capacity also, he tours around the world. He looks after how to develop and strengthen our cultural relations with various other. Uh, students all over the world and uh, eminent personalities 
and therefore very very happy to introduce him at present he is carrying a responsibility of all india vice president of bharatiya janata party also uh, dr vinay sir i welcome you very much in our this saptapanth uh, tendi lecture series thank you very much thank you <coughs> subhash sir uh, uh uh clear well they are move to the at the doctor vinay sahasra buddhi may i request uh at least sir you are not audible enough there is some problem Hello, sir can you please can you please put it hello ah now it is now go on go ahead mr atholi yeah so uh, i would request webo sir put to put our website Uh, officially to launch screen please webo sir Hello, sir. Vaibhav, sir, your voice is on mute. Yes, one cup, one cup. Vaibhav, sir, can you please put our website on the screen, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. To launch it at the auspicious hands, Doctor Vinay Sahasra Budde. My screen is visible to all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. Why? I, I launch the website. No, it's okay. So it is visible to Mukta dot in. No, it is not. Not yet. Just wait. I think screen share option is again not working here. Uh, let us let us deem it that it has yeah, been launched yeah. okay. and moved. Yeah. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Declare that it is open. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So I request Dr. Vinay Sir Sir Budde to uh, start with this session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Atholi, uh, my dear friend and uh, a long time colleague, uh, Professor. Dr. Shekhar Chandratre, uh, Dr. Subhash Atwale, Dr. Vaibhav, all other uh, professors and teachers in uh, various universities. I am told uh, that there are uh, professors and teaching community members, academia members from different universities uh, who who are, who are joining this particular session. And therefore, uh, uh, I initially thank the MUCTA. for having given me the opportunity of uh, presenting my view under this tatupan thengri memorial lecture series uh, it's an honor uh, because uh, i have seen uh, how untiringly all the senior members of the mucta have been struggling to expand the organizational network of mukta and uh, in a in an area where uh, it is uh, already uh, very tough because of the established organization of teachers uh, i i am aware that uh, it has taken a huge amount of efforts and therefore uh, i also congratulate all the members of mukta for having come this way this long and i'm sure uh, the organization has a very bright future ahead uh, friends uh, the subject of india soft power that way is uh, 
not very new because uh, when I elaborate certain aspect uh, aspects of uh, India's soft power, I'm sure you would realize that most of these things are uh, a part of your common knowledge, and therefore there is nothing new as such. What is new is perhaps the term soft power or the concept of soft power. So let me start with uh, what exactly is this concept of soft power. As uh, many of us uh, must be knowing, I'm sure, that uh, it was in 1990 that uh, Professor Dr. Joseph Nye, who was uh, for a while also the director of the Kennedy School of Government at the Harvard University, uh, he wrote a book in 1990 on soft power. And in that book, perhaps for the first time, the term soft power was uh, used by him. Uh, I think uh, there is also a reason why the concept uh, got some kind of a currency only after 1990s. Uh, by 1990, it was uh, almost more than 40 years for the conclusion of the Second World War. And by that time, uh, the world had realized the limitations of military might. I mean, uh, uh, engaging with other countries in some kind of a uh, war where uh, the design, the objective is to acquire some geographical area. I think that concept had become obsolete by 1990. Uh, we are also aware that uh, since the conclusion of the Second World War, the United Nations was established and for more than 60 years, it is functioning and fairly uh, effectively, I would say. And therefore, uh, engaging with countries uh, for a piece of geographical area, uh, idea itself became kind of obsolete, obsolete by 1990. Another important factor was that uh, before 1990, just about two years before 1990, in 1988, we saw the end of Soviet Union. It was uh, no more there on the map of the world. We now see a Eurasia, a conglomeration of several other countries, but there is nothing like Soviet Russia nowadays. And therefore, with the end of Soviet Russia, the talk about the Cold War also was given a full stop. There was no Cold War. I mean, there may not be perfect friendship between US and the US and the Russia of the present day. But of course, there was no Cold War because naturally the might and the strength that USSR had was not there with the Russia of the uh, later part of the last century. And therefore, uh, these two significant changes, perhaps, made people realize that there are limitations to military might. And therefore, being aggressive, being in a uh, mood to usurp the land of the country, maybe neighboring country or some far off country as well, in certain uh, uh, at, at certain times. But that idea, perhaps, uh, became relevant by 1990. And instead of that, that in place of occupying geographical area, geographical space, what is more important is to occupy the mind space, mind space in the minds of the people. And therefore, uh, as you would uh, realize that it was uh, perhaps in 1990s only that Thomas Friedman, very well-known columnist and political commentator, wrote a book which was rightly named by him, the world is flat. Because as he realized that everywhere countries are looking alike, cities are looking alike. There are typical uh, scenes that we come across, whether you move in London or in Paris or in uh, maybe uh, Jerusalem or uh, maybe in certain parts of the Southeast Asia, everywhere you find the world is pretty much the same. There are no regional variations. <laughs> Uh, to be seen and experienced by people. This was a, a kind of an impact of globalization as well. But it was Thomas Friedman who realized it. And those of you who must have visited Beijing 
or maybe Jerusalem. I am giving two examples because I had the occasion of visiting both these countries, and I had the first-hand experience of uh, uh, realizing that when you roam around in the cities and streets of Beijing, you cannot help but get a feeling that you are perhaps in a Mandarin America. I mean, it's all America. Only thing is that the language is different. You come across signboards and billboards which are written in Chinese or Mandarin, for that matter. But otherwise, everything is Americanized. Same experience you come across in Tel Aviv. It's a Hebrew America, more or less. But this experience you don't get, for example, in Flora Fountain or Hutatma Chowk in Mumbai or the Connaught Circus of Rajiv Gandhi Chowk in Delhi. Therefore, India, I would suggest, is uniquely positioned in so far as its own identity and identity-centric soft power is concerned. Because I believe when it comes to India and Indian soft power, the modern history of India, in fact, starts with our soft power. In the 14th century, when people started uh, looking or locating where exactly India is, and first Columbus and later on Vasco de Gama uh, set out to find out where India is located, what was the reason behind? It was the paucity, the scarcity of Indian spices. After the Constantinople War, when Europe could not have the smooth supply of Indian spices reaching out in Europe, they started to look for where exactly this India is located. And therefore, uh, eventually Vasco da Gama landed on the banks of Kerala, as we are, we are all aware. And therefore, as I said, uh, the modern history of India starts with soft power. It was the soft power which attracted people towards India insofar as the Western world is concerned, whereas insofar as the Eastern part of the globe is concerned, it was the soft power which influenced them, as we see whether we uh, visit Indonesia, Malaysia, or Thailand for that matter. Everywhere we find the influence of uh, the great epics, uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata as well. And therefore, India and Indian soft power has a <coughs> long history and a rich legacy as well, which we must appreciate when we talk about uh, Indian soft power. Now, what are the basic ingredients of India soft power? If I may put them, I believe there are five important pillars of Indian soft power. First of all, is our history and the historically important role played by India when world was, I mean, world, uh, the global population, the global community for that matter, was in the midst of skirmishes, wars, battles, and whatnot. All kinds of struggles within the uh, sections of humanity were happening. But all through these centuries, perhaps, from times immemorial, India was known as a country which does not believe in aggression. We were never known as a country of aggressors. Never were Indian kings setting out and moving into various other parts of the globe and trying to usurp the land, trying to establish their regime over there, try, trying to overthrow the established kings and monarchs over there. That was never the case. And therefore, India as a country of non-aggressors, India as a country which doesn't believe in aggression, it's something which is extremely important insofar as India's soft power is concerned. Today, for example, if India is welcome in every nook and corner of the globe, and I'm sure you also must have realized it, I had the occasion of visiting more than 20 countries, and wherever I had the occasion of going with people, I have found that people have a tremendous amount of curiosity about India first and a sizable, a, a, a cognizable part of, uh, as, uh, cognizable amount of, I would say, goodwill as well about India. Now, the job of all of us, I would suggest, is to convert this goodwill into a proper understanding about the idea of India 
and then we can really establish our soft power. So coming to the five pillars of Indian soft power, as I said, our history, which is a witness to the fact that India was never an aggressor country, stands out as the first and foremost aspect of these five essential ingredients of India's soft power regime. The second one is uh, our spiritual democracy. As all of us are aware, India is uh, a country known for uh, welcoming, accepting all ways of worship. We never accepted any kind of hegemonic or monopolistic view of uh, spirituality. We never said that ours is the only way and all other ways are invalid, as there are certain uh, ways of worship who have been advocating. That was never our case. And therefore, we always believed not only in political democracy, which we are experiencing today, but the political democratic country, in fact, I would say, start with the spiritual democracy that we have been adhering to right since several centuries. And therefore, the spiritual democracy is the second most important pillar of the Indian soft power. We always believed in Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti and never said that our way or highway. That was never the my way or highway. That was never the consideration in India. And therefore, this is the second most important aspect. The third is that India has been uh, known as a knowledge society for centuries together. I mean, basically, we are a knowledge society. Let us appreciate the fact that not only in, uh, uh, in the context of our epics, Ramayana and Mahabharat, but Take any other discipline also, whether it is uh, mathematics, whether it is lang linguistics, whether it is uh, uh, Ayurveda, and several other branches of uh, science also. And Indian, definite, Indians definitely made their mark, and therefore India came to know as a knowledge society. It was not for no reason that Fahiyan and UN Sun decided to visit India. There was some reason for that. India, after all, was known for Takshashila and Nalanda and different kinds of universities of that stage. And therefore, India as a knowledge society is the third important pillar of our soft power. When I say social system, I, in, I would like to attract your attention to the fact that India has defined through its philosophy in a very unique way as to how an individual have to relate with the society. We never accepted the ultra-individualistic American model, and we also never accepted the ultra-socialistic uh, community of relating an individual with the society. As all of us are aware, we always believed that an individual relates to the society only in a similar fashion as to a part of the body relates itself with the entire body, as what we call as Angangi Sambandh. I think this is, again, the important feature of our social system. And therefore, that, again, I would say, is the important pillar of our uh, soft power. And especially in these corona days, when world over, people are feeling very lonesome and isolated and left out also, I think in India, Perhaps our tenacity to withstand this kind of a psychological tension is far too greater than many other societies and many other communities uh, on the, uh, in, in the world. And therefore, we can sustain this because we know the importance of individuality and also the significance of collectivism. I'll give you just one example when I talk about family system. In our system, every other uh, relationship as a particular identity. We don't have all our uh, uh, cousin brothers as just cousins. We have maternal cousins. There are different names for them. We have paternal cousins. There are different names for them. We don't have the hold all name of aunts and uncles. Our maternal uncles, they are known with a different uh, nomenclature. Our paternal uncles, again, carry a different nomenclature. 
So while we respect individuality, we also emphasize on collectivism, and that is the beauty of our social as well as family systems. And that is why I would say that this is the fourth important pillar of our uh, regime. The fifth one and the last is the way we relate ourselves as a human being with Mother Nature. We were never exploiters. We always believed in uh, coexistence with Mother Nature. And we always, there are many traditions within India where we have been worshipping Mother Nature and various icons of Mother Nature. And therefore, our relationship, our own way of relating an individual with Mother Nature, which is all about sustainability and several such uh, uh, important things which are being talked about nowadays. I think they were in part of our effort from time to memorial, and therefore, this is the fifth important uh, pillar of India's soft power. Now, there are various facets on the basis uh, of these five pillars. I can uh, uh, just as a matter of uh, citing some examples. Uh, present you with some facets of the Indian soft power. As it uh, happens, it starts with uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata. It starts with our, uh, it, it has one of the important role uh, that has been played by our heritage, our history, and our unity and diversity as well. Remember, in India, whenever we move around within our country, we come across several proverbs and sayings which are of similar meaning. They carry the same core of the idea whether you go to Gujarat or to Assam or wherever. For example, uh, in Hindi, there is a proverb which says, Nach na ai angan teda. Now, a similar proverb you will find in other languages also. Now, this similarity in our approach is not because uh, some department of languages in some government issued a GR that there should be a saying which carries this particular meaning. That was not the case. No GR could have evolved so many sayings with a similar approach. It is the same, it is the similarity of our approach towards human life that, in fact, has enriched our languages with so many proverbs and sayings with a similar kind of meaning. And there lies our unity and diversity. Then there is uh, a whole range of what I describe as traditional Indian knowledge systems. For example, our Ayurveda, our yoga, the Sanskrit language, Indology as a science, uh, as, as a discipline of knowledge, all these things also form a part of our uh, soft power. Then, of course, there are different kinds of fine arts, folk arts, and uh, performing arts as well. Indian classical music has its different uh, charm. Indian uh, classical dances, whether Bharatanatyam, Kuchipudi, Manipuri, so on and so forth, they are also known for their uh, charm and uh, their, the, the philosophy, again, that goes behind it. In, in, in India, our uh, various postures in different dances are not just gymnastics. They have some kind of a meaning, some kind of a philosophical basis. Uh, take the example of various mudras. Now, all these mudras have some connotations. And therefore, this is also an important part of our soft power. Uh, there are uh, several uh, people who are um, wanting to learn Indian classical dance, Indian classical music, even Indian instruments for that matter, tabla and uh, sitar. Uh, several such instruments are extremely popular world over. And therefore, this also is a part of our important uh, soft power treasure as such. Again, one important aspect is our culinary and cuisines. As you must have realized, uh, I mean, go to any other capital city of any country and you will come across at least one, two or maybe dozens of Indian restaurants and all of them, noted down, are making a brisk business. Indian food, Indian dishes, whether South Indian, whether Bengali, whether Punjabi, whether Gujarati or Maharashtrian, Indian dishes are extremely popular world over. And therefore, this is also is uh, an important aspect of India's soft power. But mind well that the most significant aspect of India's soft power eventually will be you and me, the people of India. Because uh, 
to talk about uh, our history in uh, glowing terms is very easy. But all those uh, supremely important human values, if they are not reflected in our day-to-day -day conduct, whether within the country or when we go abroad, or people who have made other countries as their home, whom we call as NRIs, if in their day-to-day -day conduct these things do not reflect, our talk about India's greatness will come to a naught. And therefore, people of India are important aspects of India's soft power. And this realization, I believe, it's something which is the need of the hour. If this is realized pretty well by one and all, then I think there is a huge uh, possibility of enhancement of India's soft power. Friends, uh, at the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, we are uh, already engaged in uh, our mission, institutional mission of enhancing our soft power through various scholarships that we give, through various cultural troops that we send abroad, through various chairs that we have established in, in, in several universities abroad, so on and so forth. We are also going to, let me share with you since I'm interacting with the academic community, that uh, in foreign students in India is a, has a huge potential of adding to our soft power potential. Because uh, uh, soft power and basically the goodwill that India enjoys. Because as you would have realized that whether you go to Bangladesh, you go to Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Bhutan, Nepal, several other countries as well, most of the prime ministers or Supreme Court judges or looks, uh, the parliamentary presidents or chairpersons are alumni of Indian institutions. This is an important soft power. Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh Prime Minister, I had the occasion of meeting her some three years before in Dhaka at her uh, uh, residence. And she was uh, talking about India and her days uh, spent in Delhi University and several such things. So people are so much in love when, once they come over here, once they stay over here, once they understand the charm of Indian uh, uh, public life, Indian people. Indian festivities, they simply are mesmerized by that. And therefore, this is an important soft power tool, I would say. And we have to be keeping in mind. And therefore, when you come across some foreign students, they may be from Africa, from Afghanistan, maybe from Indonesia, Malaysia, keep in mind that they are going to be our ambassadors. And it is therefore incumbent upon all of us to ensure that they are treated well, they are looked after well, they are... Uh, uh, help in every possible way. I'm sure you must be doing that, but I just wanted this to be brought to your notice. Uh, then again, uh, let me also tell you that uh, uh, we are also going to uh, embark upon a new project which we have called as universalization of traditional Indian knowledge systems, which is called as UTIX. This platform, just like uh, many of you uh, must be very conversant about uh, uh, various platforms. For example, there is a platform called Coursera or edX and several such platforms are there which offer short term courses. I mean, just 10 hour or maybe 10 day or 60 hour course in a particular faculty, maybe anything in the world. Now we are going to launch certain courses, uh, which will, uh, 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 I mean, those courses will be all about Indian uh, traditions, Indian culture. For example, our tradition of Rangavali or Rangoli, as what we call it. Uh, can, can't we have a very structured course on Rangoli or Mehendi for that matter? Or the kind of uh, sky lanterns that we prepare. And there are several traditions of that. In Orissa, there are different kinds of sky lanterns. In Maharashtra, there are different kinds of sky lanterns. On this also, we can evolve a capsule and a course could be offered. Or Indian cuisines, for example, Bengali deserts, Marathi deserts, Gujarati deserts. We can create some kind of a knowledge uh, uh, dissemination mechanism out of that. And that is also on our agenda. I'm sure uh, we would require uh, uh, cooperation from academic community members like you. And I'm pretty confident that you would extend every possible help as well. Friends, uh, let me also tell you uh, that uh, after all, the charm of India, it's something uh, which uh, uh, makes people fall in love with India. 
I'll cite one example of that charm. And uh, before I conclude, I'll also cite one example how an Indian teacher, being from India, can really make a difference, which is for all of us to understand and realize. The first thing is uh, a, an incident which uh, I came across when I was in Salzburg in Austria some 20 years back. Uh, in Salzburg, there is a foundation called Salzburg Seminar. Uh, it's in Austria. It's an American from Austria, and they conduct several kinds of seminars. I'm uh, elaborately explaining you because I would suggest you people also, those who are in the academia, should be visiting the website and trying to seek some invitation, some participation in some Salzburg seminar of your choice. There are hundreds of subjects which they discuss and they invite people. At times, they sponsor also. So I was lucky enough to get selected for a Salzburg seminar, which was about democracy. And in that seminar, uh, Mr. David Gore Booth, Ambassador David Gore Booth, who was a diplomat from UK and had been uh, Indian, uh, the High Commissioner of uh, Britain to India uh, in the 1980s. He was one of the resource persons. Along with him, Mrs. Gore Booth was also there. So we had the occasion of interacting with them. Along with me, there was one more professor from Mumbai University. And both of us uh, interacted off and on during the in-between uh, period that we used to get uh, between two sessions. Uh, we used to talk a lot. And Mrs. Gore Booth used to take very keen interest in the affairs in India. And she had all very sweet memories of her uh, roaming around in India. So she used to ask us, uh, do you get the same kind of bhel puri in Chopati? Uh, do you get the same kind of parathas in Parathe Wali Gali in Delhi? And all kinds of other things also she wanted to discuss with us. And we became very friendly with her. And uh, many a times we uh, discussed several issues about India also with her. At the end of the seminar, there was a concluding speech by uh, a lady president from a tiny country in Europe, which is called as Latvia. So the Latvian president was there. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Anna Freiberga was her name. And uh, she delivered a lengthy speech at the concluding function about democracy, people's power, sovereignty, voice of the people, uh, values in democracy, and so on and so forth. And at the back of the, audi of the auditorium, we were uh, sipping uh, through our coffee cups and talking with each other while the speech was going on. And Mrs. Gurubhut uh, came to me, uh, and my Indian friend was also there. And she told me, Vinay, after the lady comes down, you should go and tell her that, uh, ma'am, you need not lecture us about democracy. Your entire country we can accommodate in one local train of Mumbai. So that was the love and affection that Mrs. Gorbuth had about India. And that was her message as well, that India, although it's a uh, extremely populous country in that sense, uh, our huge population at times becomes a problem. But at the same time, that is our strength as well. And that was the message she wanted to obliquely perhaps give. And therefore, this is the charm of India, which uh, makes people get attracted towards the idea of India. You must have marked that after Bill Clinton visited India, his approach changed. After his visit to India by President Obama, his approach changed. And therefore, India has a mesmerizing effect only after people experience what India is. And therefore, it is our responsibility to help the global community members get a very uh, positive and a memorable experience of India. In that sense, I believe the job of enhancing soft power cannot only be entrusted to a government agency or uh, uh, any government department as such. It is for all of us to contribute in this. And uh, this is more important because India is, as I said in the initial remarks, that India is very difficult to understand. It's an enigma. People cannot uh, uh, appreciate uh, several uh, uh, contradictions that are there in our society. And therefore, to help people understand that even though apparently there are contradictions, there are no contradictions and we are moving in a particular direction. This particular sense, if it's to be 
communicated to the global community it is for all of us now the last point i would like to make as to how teachers indian teachers can make uh, a big impact uh, because of our uh, fundamental understanding of the strength of teacher taught relationship and uh, let me tell you that this is a story of an indian teacher he was also a, an activist of uh, akhil bharatiya vidyarthi parishad he used to teach in arunachal school earlier and later on both he and his wife decided to migrate and they went to america they uh, decided to make their careers over there they settled down there and uh, this friend of ours started teaching in an american school he came across a wonderful experience and he himself shared it once with me once while he was teaching to the students of class 10 or 11 in that american school he came across a particular lad 15 plus something whom uh, he found that uh, whenever his lecture is on that boy used to doze all around all along used to sleep and uh, without any hesitation there was absolutely no uh, sense of uh, any wrong doing that he used to communicate i mean he was very happy even sleeping i mean uh, he didn't find that there was anything wrong about it and therefore my our friend was a little perplexed so thrice he tried to wake him up by touching on his shoulders and the boy also used to get up but again he used to sleep so when it happened at fourth or fifth time the boy stood up and he told without mincing the words to this indian teacher that sir teaching is your job whether to attend to your lecture or not is my liberty so chances are that i may fall asleep i may doze i am not disturbing you so you keep teaching don't disturb me that was the i mean if not in so many words but that was the message he wanted to give now in a country which is known for ultra individualistic approaches our friend got a little uh, taken aback and therefore uh, he decided to let him go for a while but the question as to why this boy is compelled to sleep in the class at 11 o'clock in the morning what something which made our uh, teacher friend very restless and therefore he decided to approach him he decided to meet him uh, in private and he suggested can we go for a cup of coffee the boy was hesitant but he uh, agreed and both of them went and had a cup of coffee in some mcdonald joint there the boy told him sir i understand that you are very curious to know as to why i sleep in the class but let me tell you my mother has now married to a new gentleman and this new father of mine who is a new entrant in our family simply doesn't want me to be a part of this family and therefore he is pressurizing me to find some accommodation maybe a uh, what they call as a studio accommodation a small accommodation or try to find some accommodation in a hostel now whatever i decide to do it will require some money and i don't have money and at this stage i would not be asking my mother and she may not also support me and there is absolutely no question of the father new father coming and rushing to help me and therefore i have to earn something so these days i am working in a pizza hut uh, shop uh, and uh, doing the dish washing between 9 o'clock in the night up to 3 o'clock in the morning so when i go to sleep it is almost 334 early morning naturally then even if i get up and come and attend the classes in the school it's very difficult for me to remain awake which is why i am dozing out and lastly the student said that sir it is because you have come from india that you wanted to go to the root cause and find out why i am sleeping no american teacher will even venture will even think about this because they are also equally kind of uh, individual they won't enter into your private space quote and quote so that is the impact perhaps indian philosophy 
and adherence of uh, Indian value systems really can make. And therefore, I once again would urge that uh, soft power is not something hard to understand. All of us are aware. Only thing is that in a structured manner, when this kind of a presentation we are exposed to, it makes us easy for us to understand what all it, it is about, this soft power, the concept of soft power. But it's very easy. And all of us can contribute to the strength of India's soft power. I'm sure the academic community members will definitely be joining this mission of enhancing India's soft power. Because as I said, it is the influence of community, the minds and the ways of thinking of the global community that is going to decide the ways of the world in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, we will issue many questions. We will have the question answer session. So, very first question is Nanda Jatta uh, from the Dapoli Urban Bank Senior College, Dapoli District. What are the ways to incorporate study? on India's soft for attention in degree colleges? Well, uh, so far soft power has not uh, uh, been developed or uh, it has not evolved as a independent uh, stream of knowledge. Uh, but I think in the days to come it can. And uh, since, as I said, the international politics is going to be uh, shaped more by soft power than military might or economic power as such. This is, of course, my own understanding. But uh, the faster we move towards that, uh, I think uh, the days of having soft power related subjects as a part of our curriculum in the at the degree level are not uh, uh, very far away. But it will take some time. OK, thank you, sir. sir one more question is from the Assam. <laughs> Uh, Professor Jyotiraj Pathak, Bodoland University, Assam. The question is, do you think India's soft power diplomacy is enough to counter aggressive China? Well, yes and no, uh, because uh, while Chinese uh, uh, Several years, uh, in fact, the outer world doesn't know how do they operate because uh, it's but there is a huge element of sea also around China and operates. So uh, it would answer this question, but it will that an entry on the artistic kind of, then I believe uh, India definitely uh, can surpass China because India and Indians, as I understand, within the limited exposure that I have got, enjoys more goodwill than the Chinese people as such. And one of the uh, aspects of one of the reasons for this is our proficiency in English language. Okay. So, Sir, uh, two more questions we'll take. So the question is from Sir Kanchan Fulmali from the Mumbai University Dahanukar College. The question is, what is effect of Indian culture on India's soft power? Well, I think uh, what is, whatever I have. Huh. Same, same question. What is yeah, effect of Indian culture on India's soft power? No, that is why I was trying to explain that after all, in India's culture, it's something which uh, has its foundation in Indian value system. And Indian value system, through culture or otherwise, if it is not reflected in our day-to-day -day conduct as a society, as a people, and also as an individual, then I think uh, the impact of soft power will not be uh, on the desired lines. Because, as I said, we talk about uh, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, 
and we talk about uh, social equality egalitarian society social justice even gender justice for that matter but if this idea of social justice and gender justice is not uh, translated in our conduct and if the outer world is uh, not sure whether we really uh, are committed to these values then uh, naturally people are not going to take whatever we say about india's soft power of which indian value system is an important ingredient uh, on the face value of it they will take it with a pinch of salt and therefore our own conduct as a people as a society and in that sense as an individual as well is going to determine the strength of uh, indian uh, soft power okay uh, thank you sir uh, one more question from the advocate dipali patil adwani law college mumbai the question is sahastra buddhe sir if anybody wants to start such soft skill courses in rural areas because there is a ocean of such soft skills how and where they could apply can you explain in short the procedure for the same no these short courses are uh, a project in the making we are going to start this but as i said it was only a late realization to all of us that uh, we don't have any such course for example in maharashtra let us take the example because the lady professor is also from maharashtra we have uh, several folk arts we have uh, our uh, maybe the very famous and popular launi dance or for that matter the koli dance now these dances say for example if a uh, lady who is deeply interested in indian culture and that to maharashtrian culture and uh, uh, take it from me that there are many for example in moscow there is a lady uh, a russian lady who has uh, uh, who, who speaks fluent marathi and uh, can sing some natya geeta geet of marathi theaters of marathi uh, uh, marathi drama marathi uh, uh, plays as well but people say for example as i was giving the example somebody sitting in sweden or japan or maybe brazil he wants to know whether he or she can understand or learn about what is the koli dance or what is this launi dance all about then it is for us to come out with a structured course with some <coughs> video element in it some multimedia element in it some theorization of the whole thing some history part of it some presentation something uh, pertaining to the drapery and the costume and all those things that go and the kind of steps that are there in the koli dance or in the launi dance and why are they so all these things i mean this is uh, presenting it in a form of a discipline of knowledge and later on monetizing it also of course monetization comes later on but first of all let us present it as a discipline of knowledge today for example we don't have we have some uh, loka kala academy and things like that but i don't know whether they can come out with this kind of a capsule of courses which are very student friendly and very attractively presented also and very easy uh, if we are able to do that in fact i would seek uh, seek the contribution and help from the entire academic community to help us evolve these kinds of courses yes that is the more about start then anybody can uh, get access to these courses i'm sure yes that is more clear about the soft skills some question from nashik <coughs> professor dr ms bandi malega nashik the question is how could this soft power be then intact and preserved in changing post modern scenario well i i really speaking uh, i don't understand uh, this post modernism as such as such i mean i know the definition of post modernism as such but then uh, i think uh, we always have been firmly believing in continuity with change which is uh, nitya nutan chira puratan as what we call and therefore this is uh, a country and uh, we have been uh, reading and hearing about it uh, uh, and mark tully in his famous uh, book had told us that there are no full stops in india so times may change the ways of presentation may change but uh, even in the modern post modern or post post modern or ultra modern world certain things are going to continue with the same charm and one of them is our culture and uh, several uh, uh, aspects of 
Indian culture. And therefore, I, 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 I don't think there is any need to be worried about as to what would happen in a postmodern world as what the professor would like to know. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we are taking the last questions. Uh, the question is from Dr. Asrar Siddiqui, ICL Mutilal Dhundunwala College, Washi. The question is, the, sir, it was a pleasure to be a part of your session. The contribution towards soft power is largely on the part of government initiative and conformed to Indian diaspora. As a resident Indian and teacher, what are the directives, public policy from the government to have sizable contribution from teachers? Unfortunately, since soft power itself is a new subject, and I, let me tell you that ICCR was established in 1950 when soft power as a term was not around. It was established by, uh, I mean, through the vision of uh, our first Prime Minister Pandit Nehru and first Education Minister Abul Kalam Azad. And uh, some very commendable efforts happened during the initial years. Later on, it became a part of the Foreign Affairs Ministry. And the uh, role of ICCR was also kind of thereafter very defined and very uh, very uh, uh, very specific as such and it was to make the global community understand indian culture in in a in a proper manner so in this context while teachers in india also can contribute uh, by way of uh, writing blogs making indian culture uh, more uh, easy to understand to the foreigners uh, coming out with several uh, multimedia kind of uh, uh, presentations and things like that. But one important thing is how do we engage uh, with the foreign students? And this for this engagement in the uh, world in which we are finding ourselves today, those students did not come over here. As I said, even a college, the kind of courses I am talking about, nothing prevents any institution from running such courses online and offering them. When you have teaching community over there, when you have uh, technological uh, kind of uh, facilitation almost in every other college, I mean, this should not be a big problem as such. And we can, because India is a land of uh, such a great diversity. Every particular college comes with a particular regional background and they can present their own regional culture in a particular way. Nothing, for example, uh, how to... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, any, 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 anything that goes with this how-to, but so far as uh, Indian uh, recipes are concerned. Now, uh, mango pickle and how to make uh, uh, pickle out of mangoes and what kind of ingredients and all these things. On, on the basis of this, we can create a course and it could be sold. I'm sure people are interested. There is a market provided we are ready to uh, present ourselves uh, the way people want us to present ourselves. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for this fantastic session. And I am closing, because of time constraints, uh, constraint, I am closing this uh, question answers. And uh, now we move toward the vote of thanks. Before that, I will try again one more uh, uh, our website inauguration. I try to share my screen again. I should share it is shared to all. Not to me. Sir, uh, no, it is not being shared. Okay. There is a present now button at the bottom. Ajay, sir, please give the reference uh, to Honorable Sir. So, so sorry, I didn't get you, sir. No, it is not. It is not appear on my. Uh, that is what I am saying, the Ashish sir. You please share the screen from your end. Oh, okay, okay, sir. One minute. Uh, from your end, you open the uh, link of our website and. Yes, 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 just doing that. I'm, I'm doing it.
Sir, it's not uh, getting through. It's not open. Okay, no problem. Then we'll move to the vote of thanks. Uh, I request uh, our general secretary, Professor Subhash Atavale, please give the vote of thanks. I think site is open now. Yes, site is open. Sir, just click it. Uh, the Honorable Sir will announce that uh, our site is uh, inaugurated. Please call that. Yeah. <clears throat> I declare that the site of Mukta is uh, now launched and congratulations to those who have created this website. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ashish sir, please stop the screen. Yes. Stop the sharing. Okay. Now I request Atole sir, please give vote of thanks. Atole sir, please. Your mic is mute. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weber. It is an indeed pleasure to listen to Dr. Vinay Sahasrabuddhi on the topic India's soft power. He has taken us back to 14th century and he has explained about the five pillars on the basis of which this soft power exists. He has made a mention of history, then spiritual democracy, knowledge society, social systems, and the relation with our mother nature. He has also made talked about the facets, which includes dance, art, rangoli, different kinds of foods which are available. And the foremost, he has made a stress on the people of India who are really the carriers of this soft power. I think we as the teachers, what should we do? That also he has explained in nutshell and how this idea can be passed on to our generations to come, that is to our students. He has also given a very brief and requisite answers to the questions which had been asked, which has been presented. And I think in the near future, as the vision of Dr. Sarasrabhuri, I think to be, uh, the days to come, there will be courses on how to make pickle, how to make puranpoli of Maharashtra, which is very famous, how to prepare an idli of a South Indian dish, and all such courses may come up, and we can get a very good market in India and abroad. Sir, thank you very much for giving us time for this elaborative uh, thought process, and definitely the teachers will carry this to classroom and explain the students about this software as well. I take this opportunity to thank Parth Networks Private Limited, who had made this thing possible, especially Ashish Dixit sir, Milin sir, Magdum sir, who had made restless efforts, you know, to uh, keep, to uh, take all of us to all our 2000 plus teachers all over India. Today, not less than 97 teachers from 97 university teachers from different part of India had joined this session. I take this opportunity to thank all those who have joined for this session and I further request that we will be sharing a link for the attendance purpose and for those who require the certificates, they can fill up their details and the certificates shall be posted to them on their email address. Thank you Vinay sir for uh, doing this uh, presentation for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you everybody. Yeah.
स्टॉप द स्क्रीमिंग स्ट्रीमिंग स्टॉप करें सर हाँ 